Hello and welcome back to part 19 of my tutorial series showing you how to make your own cartoon from start to finish. In this video I'm going to be showing you how I create a background in Clip Studio Paint. If you don't have Clip Studio Paint that's okay you can still follow along using another art software. In this particular case I'll be importing the background into my 2D animation software of choice which is Toon Boom Harmony Premium. But you won't have to worry about that until a future video. In previous videos of this series, I've spoken about animation pre-production and I've made tutorials showing you how I design a character and then rig and animate that character in Toon Boom Harmony. So those videos are there if you'd like to check them out. Now that we have our character, we need somewhere to put him. So I'm gonna be creating a relatively simple background for when we put the scene together. It took me over 10 hours to create this background. So this is gonna be a time-lapse style video where I'll be interjecting and talking over with my thoughts and intentions as we go. Because this background is for animation, there are a few key points you need to consider compared to say if you were doing a background for just a illustration but I'll be discussing those as we go. If you do find this video helpful, please consider subscribing to the channel. It really helps me out. But enough talking, let's get started. I created a new file at 300 PPI. And let's talk about the canvas dimensions for a moment. So let's say your animation is a resolution of 1920 by 1080, which is the amount of pixels for the length and the width. If you have certain camera movements like zooms and pans, you're going to have to take that into account when creating your background. So for example, let's say a camera does a two time zoom. You would have to make your canvas double the size of 1080. Otherwise you're going to lose some of that quality and it's going to appear pixelated or blurry because this is a bitmap image as opposed to a vector image which wouldn't lose quality as you zoom in. In addition to that, let's say your camera pans from right to left like we'll be doing. You will then need to widen the canvas to allow room for that to move. If you're going to do a cut, like say for example, you're going from a wide establishing shot of a building and then cutting to a character in a window of that building, you will probably want to consider doing a separate bespoke scene for that close up. So you don't have unnecessary large resolutions and file sizes and to accommodate for the different line thicknesses is. Generally speaking, the bigger the better because you can always scale down but you can't scale up without losing that quality. In an animation studio environment, you would typically have an animatic and a storyboard which would give you an idea of what the camera is doing. I ended up making my canvas a resolution of 8815 by 3240 and in CSP you can adjust that in the edit menu here. So the first part of this process is a very rough first draft and I'm not worrying about details at this point. I'm just focusing on the composition of the shot and where things will be placed in the scene. I started a new layer over a grey background layer and I placed the horizon line roughly in the middle so not too high not too low. I then roughly drew out everything I wanted to include in the scene thinking about the different layers that I'm going to have separate later on because I will be including a parallax in the animation where the layers move at different speeds depending on their distance from the camera. I was going for sort of a hilly countryside look, so including things like a stone wall, picket fences, a cute little cottage, bushes, trees, a viaduct, and then adding smaller details later on, like a trash can or a bin, mailbox, and a windmill in the background, and tufts of grass. When you are creating a background, try not to rush it because you kind of want it to be a character in itself. So don't make large open spaces with not a lot going on because that can be quite boring. So consider decorating it with different elements that make it interesting to look at and perhaps tell you something about the character or characters in that scene. Like I mentioned, this is a pretty simple, straightforward background. So we're not gonna worry too much about perspective apart from when it comes to drawing the cottage where I'll be using a two point perspective and also for the path leading to us where I will be doing a one point perspective. When it comes to animating this scene, 
scene. I'm not going to be doing a proper narrative because I am just putting it together for the sake of this tutorial and the animation coming up. But our character will be exiting the house, walking from the right to the left, and then approaching the apple tree where he will then probably kick it and then an apple will drop into his hand and he'll eat it and will animate him to a little bit of dialogue as well. Here I am blocking out some grayscale to help me clarify in my mind what elements need to be separate and thinking about that distance as well. So darker, more towards the camera and lighter further away. The first draft is complete. So this is where I move on to the second draft with a lot more detail, which will then prepare me for the final line work. This is where I add in the character reference, which is important for a few reasons. Firstly, we need to scale objects in our scene to be the appropriate size in relation to the character, especially if they're going to be interacting with those objects. For example, the doorway needs to be a sensible size for him to walk through. But then say you had a bench, for example, that he would be sitting on. If you didn't have that reference there, you might mistakenly make that bench too small or too big. So it's important to have those consistent sizes throughout the background. Another great reason to have a character reference is so that you can compare the line thicknesses between the character and the background. If you have the background lines, say, way thicker than the character, not only would it look a little bit strange, but it would also be very distracting and take the focus away from the character, which isn't what you want. That's if you have lines in your background. Some animations don't, and it all depends on the style of your animation. Here I make a new layer for the house second draft and I bring in a two point perspective ruler and for Clip Studio Paint that is located under the layer menu at the top and then navigate to ruler frame create a perspective ruler. I matched the horizon line to the one that we made in the draft and I placed my two points pretty far outside the canvas because if you have them too close together it can look a little obscure and give sort of a fisheye lens effect and the great thing about this perspective ruler is that as you draw it automatically snaps which will give you that accurate perspective that you want and you can also toggle the snapping on and off here I wanted to make the cottage look a little bit more interesting than just say a box. So I added some wall extrusions and then added a little bit more detail. So things like flower boxes, skirting and brick textures. Once the house was complete, I adjusted the positioning slightly and put a color behind it so it didn't get lost among all the other lines. By selecting the outside with the auto select tool and then pressing Control shift i which invers that selection and then filling it in with a color on a separate line behind our draft lines and then I merged those together. Once the second draft of the house was complete, I made a couple of new layers, one for the draft for the rest of the background and then using the shape tool, I made a wide ellipse to create a curved line guide for the wall, the ground and the fence just to make it slightly more interesting than a straight line. And then I went over it with the rough lines. And as I'm going, I'm focusing on adding more and more details. So things like tufts of grass, bushes and rocks. For the wall itself, I decided to go with kind of a vertical slab wall, kind of similar to what you might see in the British countryside. 
And after I had drawn a substantial section of that wall, I then copy and pasted it to save time and then merged them together and added some broken sections for variety, then put some texture over the top, which I would adjust later on. With the path, I wanted to add a little bit of aging and wear, similar to what I did with the wall, to make it feel like it was an environment that had been lived in for a while. So I had some overgrown grassy areas covering the path, and I would do a similar aging process with the picket fence as well, where some of them were kind of wonky and broken. I used a rough one point perspective towards the horizon line for the path leading towards the camera. And I made sure to break up some of that path line to make it feel like there wasn't a super clean boundary between the path and the grass, but instead more of a gradual transition between the two. Because the fence was below the horizon line, I added that upper edge just so it didn't feel too flat. And I added in some texture lines to give it that wood grain appearance. When it came to the trees, I liked the idea of having a fairly simple design to fall in line with the rest of the background style. Then moving on to the more distant elements with this hill, I wanted to have fields of flowers with a windmill on the top, which would then be animated later on. Little details that just give the background more character and something interesting to look at. For the archways on the viaduct, I made these using a combination of circles and squares for a more solid look rather than freehanding it. The symmetry ruler can be really handy and that's what I used for creating the trash can bin just to save time so that you don't have to draw it on both sides and so that it's exactly mirrored. And you can find the ruler tool here. That brings us to the end of the second draft. So I took all those layers and threw them into their own folder with this button here so that they were out of the way. And this allowed me to focus on the final line work. And I also lowered the opacity just like I did with the first draft, which I deleted entirely because that was no longer needed now that I had that second draft in place. Regardless of whether you consider yourself to be an organized person or not, you're gonna have a much easier time keeping all of those layers labeled in folders and if you want even color coded, which you can do with this button here. Before starting the final line work, I made additional layers for every element. I wanted to be separate and I made sure to make them vector layers, which are super useful because among other things, it allows you to delete overlapping lines without affecting other lines and this saves a huge amount of time. You can create vector layers with this button and in the eraser tool properties, make sure you tick the vector eraser box for when it comes to deleting those lines. So now that the hard part is over, it's just a case of going between layers and tracing over the draft that I'd already made. And I also made sure to match the line thickness with the character reference. To achieve a smooth line look when freehand drawing with the brush tool, make sure to have stabilization on, which you can find in the brush tool properties here. You can create straight lines from one point to another by holding control. With the trees, I liked to take advantage of the circle tool to create perfect circles and then with the vector eraser, eliminate the lines I don't need. Mm -hmm. 
house tiles, I started with a flat grid and then using the scale rotate tool here, I moved the points with control to match up with the perspective of the roof on my draft. After making the shape of the door, I copy and pasted certain parts for the windows and the door frame and then enlarged them or shrunk them and erased any parts that I didn't need. And because I had enlarged or shrunk them, the line thickness wouldn't be accurate to the rest of the lines. So I used the correct line tool here to make them the appropriate thicknesses without having to do any erasing or additional line work over the top. I forgot to do the interior of the house. So I did that here because the door will be opening as our character exits the building. With each of these layers, it was important to make the lines closed because I would be filling them with color later on and I didn't want that color to leak out to the rest of the background. I'll be making blades for the windmill in the animation software, so I didn't include them here because they will be rotating. I added a little more detail on the trees here compared to the draft because they were a little further away. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so now it's color o'clock. So I organized my layers even further by putting each element into its own folder so that each one included the line, the color, and eventually the shade or highlights or anything else I wanted to add. I would set the relevant line that I was filling as a reference layer with this button here, which would tell Clip Studio Paint what needed to be filled on the separate color layer. Make sure to enable area filling with the bucket tool properties here, which will expand the area of the fill under the line so that there are no nasty white gaps around the anti-aliasing. From here, it was rinse and repeat until everything was filled with the base color. Because the path didn't have closed lines, I had to manually close those up on the color layer. With some elements, such as the mailbox and the cottage, I made the sides that were facing the sky a little bit lighter due to the light source above. With the flowers on the hillside, I decided against giving them line work. So I just used the brush on the color layer just so they blended in with the background a little better and were slightly more subtle. I gave the sky a gradient and made the clouds a similar sort of style with the trees so that they tied in together a little more. With the door, I added in an edge because it will be opening. And I did the house color last because I wanted the other colors in the background to help me dictate what the house colors would be rather than the other way around. I added in some additional highlights to the bushes and the trees, which would be on a separate layer to the color and the line, just so that I had some flexibility if I wanted to adjust it later on. And then I followed this up with some shading. Of course, you can go more in depth with your highlights and shading, but again, I just wanted to keep this background relatively simple. I used a navy color for the shade, which I masked to the the layer below with this button and then I set it as a multiply layer here and lowered the opacity a little bit as well. This meant I didn't have to specifically assign a particular shade to each color that I had. Next was the line color. Because the character's line color is black, I wanted to make it different for the background so that the character stood out more. Most of the time, I just made the lines a darker shade of the main object color, and this can be achieved by selecting the line layer and adding a color layer effect with this button here. For the lines further away in the background, I would make them an even lighter shade. And I would also, on top of that, lower the contrast and add a little bit of a blur so they wouldn't take away focus of what was going on in the foreground and to emphasize the distance. With the foreground bushes nearer to us, I made those darker instead of lighter. And you can adjust the contrast as well as a couple of other settings by pressing Control U. And you can add a blur in the filter menu here. After everything was finished, I saved as and made a new version so that I had a backup. And now it was time for rigification. 
And what I mean by that is I wanted to make this file rig ready and prepare it for importing into my animation software. To do that, I merged down everything as much as I possibly could because I didn't need to have the line work, the color, etc., separate because it would just make the file needlessly heavier and more difficult to organize during layouts later on. For the door, I made some additional open versions, which would later be frames I could swap between during animation as it opened. I also made a bent door shape because I wanted him suddenly kicking it open in a comedic way. And I did that by using the transformation mesh tool under edit transform. Because he would be exiting the house, the last step was to create a house overlay so that he could be placed between the overlay and the underlay. And this is what the overlay looked like. Finally, I saved it as a Photoshop file because Clip Studio Paint files aren't compatible with Toon Boom Harmony. If you're not using Clip Studio Paint or Photoshop, you just have to save each layer out as a PNG image and import them that way. And there we have it. We've made our background and it's ready to import. I've made this background available for you to download on my Gumroad as a Clip Studio Paint file, a Photoshop file, and a Toon Boom file. Links for those in the description below. For further information on backgrounds, I highly recommend you check out these three videos made by the animation wizards over at BAM Animation, and I'll leave a link in the description below for their channel as well. In the next videos, I will be going over how to record dialogue for animation, as well as how to build and set up the scene in Toon Boom Harmony utilizing the library. Thank you so much for watching. If you did find this video helpful, please consider liking and subscribing. If you have any questions, feel free to throw them down in the comment section below, or you can find me over on my live stream on twitch.tv. Until next time, bye bye!